Hello and welcome to today's workshop, Introduction to Live Online Classes Using Blackboard Collaborate. Uh, today we're going to give an overview of the tool, some of its main features, a few of the specialty features that are available. We'll talk about different use cases. Uh, we'll look at all the fun stuff. I will be your host and moderator. My name is Peter Goen. I'm the Online Analytics Coordinator here at the Faculty Development Center at NIU. Uh, if you're ever interested in Blackboard support or teaching with technology, feel free to contact me at my email or my office phone. I'm always happy to answer your questions. Okay, so what is Blackboard Collaborate and why would we want to use it? There are a number of different use cases for it. I'm going to be going over some of them today. After we kind of talk about our own purpose for uh, coming to this session and a few of the things you might not have thought about before, I'm going to get into most of the basic features that you'll use probably 90-95% of the time. The things that are related to um, online classroom, synchronous, virtual face-to-face -face sessions. There are a number of features in Blackboard Collaborate. Uh, I've just here labeled them as communication tools which were available talk, video, text chat, uh, polling, different kinds of response modes, permissions for when your students uh, are maybe getting uppity or you want to give them extra control in the session, and the whiteboard. The screen here which uh, you shall see, you know, these are my whiteboard slides. There are features for drawing on it, kind of fun stuff you can do in the class. Then I'll talk about a couple different screen sharing modes you'll be able to use in your own sessions. You can share an application that's available on your computer, or you can do what's called a web tour where everyone's given their own web browser and you give them a website to go to and everyone's taken to that website. For instance, if you're trying to demo some online app or you want them to go to Google Scholar to begin some research for a class. Finally, We'll talk about how to create your own Blackboard Collaborate sessions, a number of the options that are available to you to be able to control uh, how your students interact or the kind of session that you want available. All right. So starting us off, I'm curious. Uh, what, what have you known about what's available in Blackboard Collaborate? Why have you all wanted to use it before? Feel free to uh, talk, feel free to text chat. I wanted to use one of the whiteboard features to kind of list the reasons that you've joined this session today. See a couple of people typing, excellent. And for any that will be watching this archive after we've recorded it and put it online, you won't be able to see the text chat, but I will relay some of those here. And I'd like to use one of the whiteboard features to show you how it's done. Patty says, I'm hoping to have an online course soon. OK. So online courses, uh-huh, teaching online now. Pat says, and want more modes of interaction. OK. So synchronous, live discussion among students. Ed says, exploring different ways to implement synchronous sessions. Yes. So this is only one of uh, the two main tools available on campus. There is Blackboard Collaborate, and there is Adobe Connect. And while uh, faculty development typically doesn't run any Connect sessions, that would be available typically through e-learning if you're interested in learning more about that. Alicia says, I am looking to explore the uses, teach an off-site clinical. Don't see your students every week. Yeah, so if you're doing fully online or blended, uh, this is great for both. Better communicate with students. Yes, communicating with students in general. Uh, there are a number of features for you. Missy, I would like to implement when I'm not on campus as an option. Yes, so I wanted to explore a lot of these other uses that are available to you as well. OK, so those are great. Yeah, just a few of the different things that people might want to think about. And if you've only thought about one of these ones, you can think of a number of different modes, different uses for this tool. Again, we'll go over the features, so as I'm talking about things, you might get some more ideas. But a few of the ones that we've heard about before here on campus, other than just uh, the standard online classroom looking to do you know, face-to-face -face but online, where everyone's in the same room. 
You might think about uh, less formal classroom work where either you get together with students or you enable your students to be able to work on some group work together. That's available. You can, just like I did today, invite people in with a guest link. You could invite in a guest lecturer. That's a perfectly good uh, option for you all. Maybe you want to co-present with someone else. All these are excellent reasons to be able to use Blackboard Collaborate. Uh, if there's any time a student needs to contact you for some extra help or, uh, you know, they email you and they have this lengthy series of questions and you think it would be easier to answer them as close to face-to-face -face as possible, this is an excellent use of this tool. Uh, or, like I said in this last one, maybe there's something that uh, you wanted to make available to your students later on. I know a few people here on campus use Blackboard Collaborate to record themselves talking over their slides. There are a number of different tools to do that. Uh, Daniel Cabrera here at Faculty Development does workshops on Adobe Presenter and Camtasia. If you're ever interested in one of these more formal screencasting tools, I would recommend uh, giving him an email or call sometime. He can help you with some of those. But Blackboard Collaborate, if you're familiar with, can do that pretty well too. Uh, you wouldn't necessarily get the automatic transcription that you might be able to in one of these other things, but, you know, this is a perfectly good use of this kind of screen sharing as well. A few others would be uh, emergencies here on campus. Maybe there's a snow day. Of course, we're in the summer, so that's less likely, um, but maybe there's something else that's keeping you or a lot of your students away from campus for some reason. Planning around emergencies. This is an excellent thing to begin thinking about now. You know, what would happen if you're teaching a face-to-face -face course or a blended course and all of a sudden you can't make it? Maybe there's some uh, family emergency, God forbid. Uh, something else that's keeping you away. This is something to always keep in your back, back of your mind, keep in your pocket to be able to pull out when necessary. Online office hours, this is another good use. Uh, maybe you were away at a conference and you can't make it back. You want to hold off office hours that week. You could hold them online. Uh, perfectly valid tool. A lot of people use it for that. And uh, just in general, any kind of conversation you want that has these kinds of features where you can enable uh, virtual teleconferencing or you've got access to voice and video, uh, people can still chat if they aren't able to join you with video or audio. They don't have a microphone, for instance. It has all these features to be able to do these different kinds of things, to enable these different kinds of uses. All righty. Any questions? Anything else you all had thought about uh, while I was talking here that you'd want to be able to use this for? I don't see anyone immediately responding, so I guess I must have blown your minds with all the different possibilities. All righty. Let's get started with some of the main features here. So I wanted to start out with going through the interface as both a participant and as a moderator. And I'll talk about uh, kind of the basic features that your students would see initially, and then some of the extra ones that you get when you'll be running your own. So to begin, I'd like to point out the three different panels on the left. You'll see here audio and video, participants, chat. For those viewing the archive later on, you can follow me as I'm waving my mouse cursor pointer around. For those here who are joining me live, of course, check where I'm uh, indicating on the slide versus what you're seeing on your own screens. You can get a feel for uh, how this actually looks live as you're working with all these different features. Okay, so to begin, we have these three different uh, panels here. And uh, one thing that you all who are joining me live can do right now is feel free to play around with the panels themselves. You'll see that there are these dividing lines between them you're actually able to, if you click on that dividing line, hold your mouse cursor down and move it up and down, resize the different windows. So you can play around with maybe how big you want your participants interface to be or how much of chat you see. Maybe at the beginning, you'll expand the participants window to be as big as possible so that you can get a feel for who's joining your session, taking attendance as I was doing today. 
but uh, later on once you begin lecturing yourself, you begin your class, maybe expand the chat window so that you get more of an idea about how your class is trying to interact with you, any questions they're asking, etc. One other thing you can do with the uh, windows here, if you click your mouse cursor down on any of the uh, top bar on the titles to them, hold your mouse button down and then drag them elsewhere off the window, you'll be able to actually detach them from the main Blackboard Collaborate interface so that you could then expand them to however big you want them to be. This might not strike you as immediately all that useful, but if you, for instance, have a second monitor, maybe you want to keep your participants interface and your chat on the separate monitor so that you can better be able to see uh, who else joining the session, who's raising their hands, and who's talking in the text chat. Stuff like that. Gives you a little bit of freedom, flexibility, especially if you have two smaller monitors to be able to monitor your classroom. All right. Talking about each of the uh, panels in turn. We begin with audio and video. So when you first joined, I had a slide that asked you to run your audio setup wizard. You'll see a little blue microphone icon up at the top of the audio and video panel. Clicking that will allow you to make sure that your video and your audio are set up properly. This is one thing we commonly request our participants for any of our workshops to do. Usually, if you've done it once, you'll be good to go for the rest of the semester or the year. Every now and then, though, some of those settings get messed up, so we just ask our participants to do it each time just to make sure that you can still hear us, you can still interact with the class. It's a good thing to make sure to recommend to your students, especially if you begin your lecture and they begin typing in the text chat, we can't hear you. Of course, first make sure that you're actually talking, make sure that you've enabled your talk. But uh, if you know that you are talking, you yourself ran through the audio setup wizard, you know that your audio is working correctly, point that feature out to them, make sure that they've gone through it themselves. It's likely that they haven't enabled their audio, maybe their volume isn't turned up. That will identify those kinds of issues. If they're still having problems, you can refer them to Blackboard support. Blackboard has 24-7 support. Uh, I believe I have a slide here that listed that. I'll just, let's see if I refer back to that here. Yeah, so for technical support, there's a toll-free number that's available 24-7. This is a good slide to have. If you like these slides, I can send them to you later on, too. They're just kind of handy housekeeping things for your students, uh, for you to have just to kind of help them along, too. Okay. So that's the audio setup wizard, something very important. Uh, other than that, there are a few basic controls. There's obviously the presenter who's currently talking. If someone else began broadcasting and I stopped, they would be the one here who would be shown. I believe this can show up to about six different presenters at a time. Six is the maximum you have. You can control how many are able to present at one time. You can always control who has uh, permissions to be able to do so. There are then uh, volume both for the microphone that you're broadcasting. So if your students ask you, you know, we can't hear you, maybe you want to turn this up a little bit. But you can also turn up your own speakers to be able to hear them. So the second one here is for speakers, this second slider. So if you can't hear me, that's one way to adjust me. Of course, if you've turned your volume all the way up and you still need help, you know, raise your hand, type in text chat, talk to me, let me know that you can't hear me. All these modes of communication are possible to give me feedback as a presenter to let me know that you know, I need to do something differently. After that, there are the talk and the video buttons. Uh, these should be fairly self-explanatory. If you want to broadcast your audio, you'll press the talk button. If you want to show your webcam, you'll show the video button. The video button also has this second piece here. If you click that, you will just test your own webcam without actually broadcasting it to your audience. So once you actually want to do so, click the main piece of the video button. You can then tell that you're broadcasting audio or video when it shows a blue uh, microphone or webcam on those buttons. They'll also be highlighted to let you know that you're broadcasting. So if anyone wants to, if they've enabled their talk right now, 
Uh, if you'd like to test them out, I'll give you a few seconds here. Maybe talk to the rest of the class, wish everyone a good day. Hi, Not everyone, everyone, of course, has access to them. Excellent. Hi, Alicia. Hello. Hello, everybody. Hi, Ed. Thank you all for joining us today. Yeah, good. So everyone else here in the class can see what it's like when anyone else is broadcasting. You'll notice that my portrait went away. Uh, Alicia and Ed would have shown up if they had enabled their profile here, but we, at least we got uh, their name so that we knew who was talking. Nice feature. Ah, Kate, thank you for joining us. So after the audio video panel talking about broadcasting your audio or video, we have the participants panel here. This should be fairly obvious as well. This gives you your list of who's joined your session. You'll see up here at the top your own name, your own portrait. You'll see uh, which features you currently have access to and whether or not you're using them. And then underneath here are a few other uh, response tools. You have access to an emoticon, an away button, a hand raise button, and then polling options. So if you use uh, the emoticons, you can give me feedback or the rest of the class feedback. Uh, you'll see a number of different things here. Uh, there is a smiley face. If uh, I'm doing a good job or a bad job, you could give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down. If I'm talking too fast, you could tell me to slow down. All those kinds of things are available. Feel free to play around with some of those. After the emoticons, then, is the away button. So if you click the away button, it'll show just a nice little away message underneath your name, letting me as the moderator know that uh, you've stepped away. In that case, maybe I'm talking in class. I'm about ready to call on people. Maybe there's a pop quiz or something. I just want to let, I just want to get some feedback from my class, see how well I'm doing, making sure that my students understand who I am. If you set yourself to away, you'll let me know that okay, you're not there right now, I won't call on you, I can call on someone else. Or as the moderator, you can let your class know that you've stepped away. Maybe uh, you're, you've just set up your slides, class is about ready to begin, but you're stepping away to go get something to drink. Uh, that way, you know, they know that you're not there just yet, but you'll be back. Afterwards is the hand raise button, and this one's very important for moderators to know about. You know, let your class know that if they ever have a question of you, they can type it in the text chat, of course. But if you raise your virtual hand, you as the moderator get this audible ding to let you know that someone is going to ask a question, and then you can call on them. And you'll see down here there's a cute little hand raise icon, and it keeps an order, too. So feel free. Go ahead and raise your hands right now. See what that looks like. Yeah, and you're not going to be getting the audibles, but I will. And then I know I can see uh, Patty, then Kate. Everyone's raising their hands, lowering their hands. And as you raise or lower them, it maintains that order. So I know that uh, as my class is getting their questions answered, who to call on next. All right. And Bill, go ahead and keep your hand up for right now. I am actually going to use a moderator feature. So I'm going to lower his hand. So if someone maybe has their hand raised and then they step away, maybe you call on them in class, you give them a minute to try to respond, they're not responding, you as the moderator can go in and lower their hand later on. That feature is available for you. Okay. So after the hand raise then is your polling options. And these are just basic polling options to make sure that your class is kind of getting what you're asking. So let's see. I'll rerun this one just to make absolutely sure for the people who have joined us, can you still hear the presenter? Yes or no, feel free to give me a check mark if you can. If you can't, well, I guess I'll try working with you to make sure that you can somehow. Good, I'm getting mostly green check marks. That's good to hear. Or good to see, rather. Good, even a couple of people that just joined. Perfect. OK. Now, you'll see that that was a yes, no question, but you can enable different features. Uh, for instance, a A through C and A through E, I believe, is the maximum. 
So they're just basic polls, and you'll notice that as you all are responding to them as participants, you're able to see each other's answers. So this isn't for any kind of high stakes quizzing. It's mostly just for basic assessment to make sure that your class knows uh, what you're talking about. But uh, it's a nice little feature, handy available to you. Uh, if you've got some quiz question uh, embedded on a PowerPoint slide, then you can change to reflect, you can change your polling options to reflect, you know, multiple choice or true false. Very handy. Okay. Then after those polling features, the response features is the main participants panel list. You'll see a uh, list of moderators up at the top, followed by a list of participants. For participants, you'll be able to see whether or not they've raised their hand, whether or not they're away. Uh, the response options and which permissions they currently have. So if I've given people specific permissions or taken away specific permissions, you'll see uh, those reflected within the uh, participants panel here. One other thing for people who are live right now, if you notice next to Anne Marie's name, for those who just joined us, Anne Marie has a special little blue rectangle icon. That denotes that she's on a tablet device of some sort, whether or not that's a uh, Apple iPad or some kind of Android tablet. She's joining us here on mobile, which is pretty cool. So there's virtually no reason for your students not to be able to join your sessions as long as they're able to get on some kind of device. For those who can't get on an internet capable device, oh, and I see this slide is a little bit out of date, uh, right above my cursor here, you don't see it on my slide, but you'd be able to see it on the live collaborate interface. There's a blue telephone icon uh, for those here. That's for being able to dial in just to be able to get the audio, which is handy. I actually had one person join one of my online workshops once from a train. Uh, they weren't able to maintain a good enough connection on their smartphone to be able to see me talk over my slides but they were able to call in to be able to hear me as I was talking during the workshop. Okay, and I see uh, Ari here is typing in the text chat. Give her a few seconds to respond. For those who are wondering how I can tell, there's a blue text chat icon next to her name. That lets, again, me as the presenter know that someone's typing in the text chat. Maybe they've got a question. I'm going to anticipate that. Just kinds of things to think about uh, when you're lecturing yourself give her a second to respond, but I'll talk about the text chat myself here. Testing private chat. Oh, good. Okay. So yeah, private chat is available. I have enabled that for everyone. Uh, so down here in the chat interface, very simple. Uh, you'll be able to see people's names and what they're talking about. And uh, if anyone wants to use the text chat, all you do is you just click in that little white box and you begin typing. There's also a cute little emoticon icon there. It's a little hard to see. It's kind of really light gray. But if you uh, click on that, you'll be able to see a number of different emoticons and be able to put them in the text chat as well. Alrighty. And uh, private chat is available between participants, between participants and moderators. You yourself can enable whether or not moderators are able to see private chats too. So I do see a couple of people talking amongst themselves. That's perfectly fine. This is something I always like to enable as a moderator to make sure that students aren't harassing themselves or harassing each other. Uh, that way, if I do see some kind of background abuse, I can private chat with them too, let them know, hey, cut it out. And if I see it going on even longer, I can then take away their privileges to be able to use that text chat. All right. So those are the main three panels here and the different kinds of things you can do with them. A lot of basic stuff, the kinds of things that you would need to be able to manage a class online to reflect uh, different kinds of things that you'd otherwise be able to do in class. Okay. Ah. Pat asks, how do you start a private chat? So if you wave your mouse cursor over someone's name, you'll see a little icon pop up that looks like a few lines with a drop down arrow. That's the options menu. You can also get to that by right clicking on their name. If you do so, you'll see a start private chat with thus and such person. And then if you click that, you'll enable a private chat between them. You should then 
and I'll point this out on the moderator interface, get a special tab across the bottom. Uh, there will be one at the beginning here called main room. That will be the one enabled for the entire class. And then you'll get a second one, which is just between you and this other person. Good question. Yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to raise your hand, ask these in chat, etc. You're very welcome. Yeah, good. Glad I can answer these kinds of questions. Especially if you're going to be using this in your own classes and you think of anything, uh, ask me to stop. I can answer any of these that you have because there are a lot of little nuances for this. Okay. So, so far, we have all been using uh, the main panels and this whiteboard feature here. Uh, this main area here where you can add your PowerPoint slides. Now, you as participants don't get the ability to add your own. That's only available for moderators. But if I enable it, you would also have access to a few extra features to be able to draw on this slide. We're going to do that in just a bit. But for right now, I want to point it out just in case you're confused why on this slide I have some extra uh, buttons, but you might not right now. So again, that's just this whiteboard feature. There are two others which we'll talk about later on. There's the application share and the web tour. You as participants will be able to see these buttons, but they're currently grayed out, letting you know that you don't have access to start them, but to show you that they are there and available. You also might not be able to see all of the controls I have as a moderator, though we'll look at those on this slide in a second. But you should be able to see a few things to help you as participants uh, better view the slides. So there's this fit to page button drop down over here. This allows you to zoom in and out of slides. It's something very handy to let your students who have uh, visual impairments know about. If you click that, then you'll be able to zoom in, zoom out. Uh, maybe also if you're on a small monitor, you want to zoom in on a slide because it's really hard to see. That's available there too. Other than that, a couple of buttons. Uh, there's a session information button, and there's a recording uh, window label there to let you know if I'm recording, this session is recorded. It will be available online later on. And uh, if I am recording, you'd be able to see that uh, red button. And right now, that is there and available to let you know that I'm doing that as well. OK. So moving right along, fly through some of the extra moderator features. Uh, a few things to point out. So in this whiteboard here, you'll see that I have access to a few other things. I can create new slides on the fly. I can delete slides if maybe I've made something or I've added something and it's a duplicate. I want to delete that. There are controls for moving back and forth between slides. There's a drop down to be able to move between specific sl slides if I want to. Uh, for instance, earlier on, I moved from the slide I was on just previously, the participant interface, back to one of my kind of housekeeping slides, as I said. So you can jump. Uh, way back and forth instead of just going to the next one too. Other than that, you'll see uh, up here, if you're moderators, there would be a uh, list of permissions that you can enable for the entire class. As for participants, you won't be able to see those, but know that there is a way to take away everyone's privileges at once. <coughs> Excuse me. Or if I were hovering my mouse cursor over someone and I was a moderator, I'd be able to enable or disable specific options. For instance, the text chat or your talkability. Uh, so that's handy for just basic classroom management. When we were using the uh, polling options earlier, I had available to a customized view to be able to see how many of which type of response my class was giving up here at the top. Uh, there's this nice little summary of who's responded in what way and a button to be able to clear those out. Next in the uh, text chat, you'll see that I automatically as a moderator have not only the main room tab, <coughs> but a specific moderator only chat uh, window. That helps you uh, privately chat with all other moderators that might be joining, for instance, a co-presenter or an invited lecturer, which you promote to moderator as well. Promoting to moderator is, a, uh, is an option for you. You don't have to set all of this up beforehand. So if I wanted to, I could click on Emma here, right click her name, <coughs> excuse me, 
and specifically give her moderator privileges later on. So if you have a guest lecturer, maybe you send them the guest link. They come in. <coughs> Excuse me, just one second. And then uh, you could give her moderator privileges specifically. <coughs> Excuse me, I seem to be losing my voice. Occupational hazard. And uh, that way you wouldn't have to, when you're setting up your session, remember to do all of that beforehand. Or if you wanted to give a student, maybe who's doing their own presentation in class, all of the features available to them, you could just promote them to moderator, and uh, that would allow them to present to the entire class very easily and effectively. OK. As moderator, too, then you would see the top few options not grayed out, so you'd be able to move between the three different uh, main view modes. There's also, I'd like to point out, these two buttons up here at the top, load content and record. Record is fairly self-explanatory. When you start that, it'll ask you yes or no, do you want to begin recording? And load content is here for your slides. It only works with PowerPoint, so not uh, Apple's Keynote, but usually most tools can export to PowerPoint, so it's pretty simple. Uh, you just click the load content button, you find wherever the PowerPoint slides are available on your uh, computer, and then it'll load those as screenshots of your slides into Blackboard Collaborate. So it won't preserve any fancy transitions, animations, or uh, neat sounds that you've embedded in your slides. It won't preserve uh, video either. So for anyone who's embedded a YouTube video, those wouldn't be available, though there are ways around that, which we'll explore shortly. But this is the way for you to load any of your PowerPoint slides to be able to present your uh, main topic of the day. OK. Any other questions about moderator features uses here? Those are kind of the main simple ones to be able to manage your classroom. There are other things, though, available to you, which I at least should mention here. Uh, there was one thing that I began at the, uh, before anything started. Up here in the top area, it's mostly just a kind of gray blank place, but there's a timer feature. For those who joined us really early, you would have noticed that I had enabled the timer to let you know how long until we began the workshop today. That's something that's always kind of nice to do uh, when you're setting up your own classes, to let your students know when class will start. So there's a timer feature. Uh, I haven't enabled them today, but there are group work that you can do. You can have what are called breakout rooms to let your students uh, break into subsections to be able to work on things amongst themselves. Oh, I see Patty asks a question here. Can students see each other's responses in a poll? Yes, they can. So it's really just for uh, simple feedback to you as the instructor to know how well your students are understanding you more than anything else. I'm just wondering if it's a quick quiz, uh, would they be able to copy answers? Yes. Yes. Yeah, they'll be able to see everyone else's. And um, you can also copy the text chat. So if they're asking questions, they're responding there, you'd be able to save that for later. Another thing that you might think about doing. Good question. Excellent. OK. So moving right along, because I see we only have about 15, 20 minutes left here wanted to allow you to play around with the whiteboard just to get a uh, feel for that. So up at the top, in the participants interface as a moderator again, I talked about giving people global permissions to be able to use different features. So I could take everyone's text chat away, or I'm going to enable the whiteboard for everyone else. So now you all should be able to see that uh, panel that was over on the side with the fun little drawing options. Let me move back to the moderator interface quickly just to point those out. So you'll see a uh, pointer to be able to select things, pointer options to be able to point to things on the screen as I was doing. There are drawing options, text options. You can make shapes of different kinds, lines, add screenshots. So I wanted to ask everyone, uh, are you going anywhere on summer vacation? Or if you could go anywhere, well, at least within the US, where would you like to go? So feel free to use some of those to either point things out or circle them. You can draw on the screen with some of the drawing options. You'll notice there's a lot of different things that you can do. 
so you yourself as moderator could create an entire new slide and as I did early on in the session, list out maybe some of the things that your students are telling you or they can add some things to a slide to make a list. You can create a new slide on the fly, create a quick poll, A, B, C, D, enable that. Okay, so people are moving all around here, pointing to different things on the map, circling different things, Florida, Texas, cool. Yeah, people would like to go different places. <laughs> I see someone has added an Amazon link, okay. I didn't expect spam today, but that's, that's interesting and fine, I guess. Yeah. So all these different kinds of things are available to you to do. If someone is drawing on the screen, if you use that first option, that select pointer option, you can then click on what someone's drawn, select it, move it around, resize it. You can even right click it to see who has made certain things too, just in case um, maybe someone's drawn something that you don't want on the screen. You can right click it, find out who it is, and then delete it just by hitting the delete key. So all those are available to you as a moderator, which is really nice and handy. This is useful too if you want to allow uh, breakout sessions and then your students would be able to have their own whiteboards, create their own slides, bring everyone back to class, and then later on add their slides to the main classroom too. Okay. You see everyone's having a lot of fun with that. Good. For anyone who's interested um, with the pointers that you're placing on the map, most people have seen that if you just click your mouse, it'll leave your cursor behind. But if you click your mouse, you hold it down, and you drag it around the map, that's when you'll be able to gesture to things on the slide. All righty. Any other questions before I move on to some of the special features? Well, I don't see anyone typing in the chat. Oh, maybe have one incoming, okay. Now you as participants with access to the whiteboard features wouldn't be able to still add your slides, but um, let's see, okay, now we've got the question. Click the camera and it opened a dialog box. Camera options, that is for uh, taking a screenshot and then maybe adding a picture to uh, the whiteboard here, which might be useful if you want to take a screenshot of something else on your screen and add that as a slide. That could be useful. Maybe uh, you wanted to demonstrate some app in class, which I'll do in just a second, but you first wanted a slide of that, just a screenshot of it, a picture showing what it looks like, talk about it first, and then begin sharing that, uh, which we'll investigate shortly. Alrighty, no other questions then? I would like to demonstrate those really quickly. So I'm going to take away everyone's whiteboard privileges. Oh no. Alright, and then move on to a couple of advanced features here, which you probably won't use too often, but are available and are really good to know about uh, in certain instances. So first off, I'm going to demonstrate the application sharing. Now, I just clicked the second icon up at the top above the whiteboard area. It should have blanked everyone's screen out. Then I, as the moderator, get a dialog box letting me know that I'm about to begin an application share. And I just wanted to show you what this all is like. So, uh, some people have seen this before in Collaborate, in Skype, where I want to demonstrate a different app. Maybe I want to show people how to use uh, Adobe Photoshop, how to touch up photos, or maybe I want to show people how to use certain features in SPSS to show you how to do um, statistical modeling of some sort. Any other uh, app that you have running on your computer, you can then show to the class. Okay, so I've got this Word doc that I want to show to my class here, just as a kind of example about how I'd share something with people. All I do is I get a uh, dialog box showing me what other apps I have running on my desktop. 
I click one of those and then I click a sharing button. And now you all should be seeing what I'm seeing on my computer. Do you get that? Uh, feel free to give me uh, another green check mark if you can see this Word document on blended learning. Okay, Kate, Ed, good. Most of the class is seeing that. Perfect. So I could then begin talking about um, you know, advanced features in Microsoft Word. Fun. You know, maybe I'll show you how to add bold to things, or maybe add headers or footers or anything like that. You should then be seeing what I'm seeing on my screen as I am doing any of those things. So I can scroll, and I'm going to be doing these certain things slowly because what it's basically doing behind the scenes is taking rapid fire screenshots of my screen and pushing it out to my participants. So you want to make sure to go uh, not as fast as you might be tempted to normally when you're demonstrating things in a live class when they're there viewing them on maybe an overhead projector. So all of this is taking place over the internet, but you would be able to demonstrate a particular app. And you would also be able to give uh, someone else access to use an app that's running on your computer. So let's see. Uh, feel free to raise your hand. Whoever's fast enough will be able to use my Word doc. Kate, you in? Okay. So let me try to give control of shared application with you. So just like we did when we went into private chat, you can right click someone's name as a moderator. And when you're in the application share, give access to the application to someone else. So I'm going to give control of shared applications to Kate. And then it gives me a dialog box letting me know that Kate now has access to it. If I want to take back control, I can press control and spacebar at the same time. OK, so now you should have access to that. Feel free to move your mouse cursor around, do whatever you want. My hands are away from the mouse. Everything Kate is doing right now is completely of her own accord, and yet the application is not on her computer. It's still on mine. <laughs> and she's adding a, uh, a nice message there. She's now in control. This is Kate with a funny emoticon. All right. And uh, Kate, move your mouse cursor around. Just keep waving it around if you would. One thing to note, when she's doing things, I as the moderator can move it too, and we begin fighting for control of it. You'll notice it's kind of going crazy all over the place. So when you've given else, someone else access to it, make sure that um, you're not moving your mouse cursor around too, or else it'll get a little confusing for everyone involved. OK. Now, Kate has had her fun, so I'm going to hit, uh, hit Control and Spacebar at the same time. And now I should have control back myself. And then you all wouldn't be able to see it, but I, as the moderator, up here above the window, I have a few extra controls, including a stop button. So I'm going to hit that right now, and that'll bring us back to the main whiteboard area where I could begin sharing a different application, or I could move back to my PowerPoint slides, etc. OK, so that's application share. Last but not least is the web tour feature. So I'm going to click that button up at the top, and then this should begin a web tour. Now, you all don't have access to be able to go wherever you want just now. Uh, but if I were to give you web tour permissions, you all could then take the class to some other website, which I would like to do. Earlier on, I talked about maybe I want to demonstrate how to use Google Scholar. So for instance, maybe I start an application share showing the class how to use Google Scholar. And then I want to give them some time on their own, on their own machines. I could then begin a web tour, which you'll see in just a second, and push everyone to Google Scholar. So I've typed that out. I'm going to hit my Enter key. And now it should load a web browser within Blackboard Collaborate, and everyone should be on literally the same web page. Do you all see that right now? Feel free to give me another green check mark if you can see that. Good. Excellent. Seems like at least almost everyone is there. And Marie, I apologize. This is one of the features that is currently not available on mobile applications, but it is something to, uh, just to let everyone know that is predominantly available across platforms as long as you're able to get access to uh, the main Blackboard Collaborate. OK, so now we're on Google Scholar. If I were to take you to a different web page, Let's say I click on the My Library. It would refresh all of your web pages, too. 
but uh, this is one thing to do uh, if you're trying to share a resource on the web and then give everyone else an opportunity to do things on their own. So feel free, you can type things in Google Scholar. If I were to do a search, it would take you all to the page that I was on. You wouldn't see everything I'm doing at that point. Again, that's really more for an application share. But uh, this gives you all an opportunity to do something on your own, but kind of, kind of together as a class. One of its biggest use cases is, for instance, uh, showing a video. So let me quickly also take you to YouTube. And since we are talking about blended learning, maybe I want to talk about a blended learning video. So I search for blended learning videos, and you all should be taken to these different pages as I'm moving through them. But then I can share a YouTube video with you, and we can all kind of view it at the same time, more or less, as a class. OK. Now, since it's going to start playing for you, there we go. Just wanted to stop it so it wasn't annoying anyone there, and you can still hear me. But know that uh, that's available to you. This is one of the easiest ways of taking your class to a YouTube video at the same time. You could app share it with people, but that's really not the uh, best or easiest way to do that kind of thing. If I were to app share that, application share, since it takes quick screenshots and pushes it out to the class, it would be really choppy. It would be kind of hard to understand. So if you wanted to share a video with your students, uh, putting it on YouTube, and then taking them to YouTube through the web tour would be the best way. OK, so hopefully that gives you all a good idea about uh, some of the different things that are available within Blackboard Collaborate. I see we only have a few minutes left. I wanted to really quickly run through session creation with everyone. Uh, feel free, if you have to leave right now, you can. We can always get together later on and um, chat about uh, any other features that you wanted to look at. I'll quickly uh, give you my contact information, too. If you do have to go, you can write this down right now. But uh, for anyone who's able to stick around for a few minutes, I want to quickly walk through all the different session options that are available to you for creating your own Blackboard Collaborate sessions. OK, and to do that, I'm going to start another uh, Blackboard Collaborate app share, this time with my web browser. So I'm going to start another app share. I'm going to choose Firefox, since I'm currently using Firefox. And I'm going to share that with the class. Now, this is a fairly big window. Well, there might be a problem with it being so big. Let me know if it's a little hard to uh, see for everyone. I can try refreshing, recreating that as a little bit smaller, so maybe it's a little bit easier for you all to see here. And I'll give you all a few extra seconds to make sure that it refreshes for you just fine. And then I'm going to move in and show you where to find Blackboard Collaborate, as well as how to create sessions for your own classes. OK. So hopefully everyone can see this. If you can, please give me another green check mark. This helps me understand that everyone is on the same page. OK, I'm getting a few. Good, excellent. Thank you all. So Blackboard Collaborate, you can find listed under Tools. So if I click Tools here, this should take us to the main uh, classroom tools that are available to everyone. And it's right there under Bs with the other Bs, Blackboard Collaborate. It is also available under the Course Management Control Panel under Course Tools. So if I click and expand that, you'll see Blackboard Collaborate right here. So if you click Blackboard Collaborate in either of these areas, this will take you to the main page where, oh my, OK. <laughs> This will look a little funny for anyone who's already seen this page in your own classes. But this is, would be where you see your uh, different sessions that are already available, the ones that have just passed, the recordings that may be available to you, et cetera. So why I laughed originally is this is one of our training courses. And there are a lot of people added to this course as instructors. So you'll see at the, at the very beginning is the main classroom, which is always available for you. It's kind of a default room. You can, you can use this one whenever you want. Uh, we generally recommend creating sessions on your own, though. But this is available for you if maybe you just need some place to access uh, things with a uh, research collaborator or a student really quickly right now. You don't want to set up your own sessions. 
There is also a room available just to you as, a, um, as an instructor, and you control who's able to access any of these. At the end here, then, is where you go and you create your own session. You'll notice with a few of these, uh, you can, with the default ones anyway, you can edit these rooms to enable certain permissions. You can add a link to these rooms to another place in, uh, in Blackboard, maybe in a content area or on your menu bar. And for the uh, place where you schedule sessions, where you create sessions, there is a set defaults link to enable specific uh, session details, settings that you want to enable every time. OK. So I'm going to click this Create Session button, and then we can take a look at these options really quickly before we break. All right. So as with pretty much everything else in Blackboard, you can give it a name. You'll notice by default, it shows the name of your class. But maybe instead, we want to say this is uh, Week 2 Class and this one is about maybe macroeconomics. And this one meets on, this one will meet tomorrow. And then we can, uh, it's a good quick way for your students to be able to see, get an idea about, you know, which class session they're joining. After the name then, if I click these, you can show, uh, you, you select the start and end times for your class. So let's say it meets tomorrow at 3 from 3 to 6.30. So I'll select tomorrow's date. I'll then use these sliders down here to select what hour this is. They're kind of odd. You'll see sliders, instead of being able to type in times, I can't actually select these times and type it in. But uh, it's intuitive enough once you've seen it. So then I've selected, uh, whoops, 6. I wanted to do 3 p.m. for the beginning time, and then 6 p.m. for the ending time, well, 6.30 is fine. Click Done. You can enable uh, repetition if you, want a, if you want to meet for class every week. This would then be able to define you know, weekly, daily, which days, etc. A certain number of occurrences allow you to enable any of that. That is available for you. Uh, sometimes it's, always, it's not the most convenient if you're skipping certain weeks because you can't tell it not to schedule a certain one. You could always put an announcement in your class to let your students know we won't actually be meeting that week. It also doesn't change the uh, session names. It just schedules them. Uh, so, when, so I believe it just it would say maybe uh, weekly lectures or something dash, and then it'll add a number to it, something like that. It's not the most um, explicit for your class, though. After that is a very handy option, early session entry. This one you will always want to make sure to enable. Uh, it allows you and your students to get into class beforehand, which is most helpful for you since you need some extra time to make sure to add your slides if you're using slides for the class. I typically say 45 minutes or an hour is a good amount of time. Uh, it gives me some time to get in way before any students are most like, likely going to join. And then that way, if I need some extra time to set up some slides, maybe create some extra ones, review everything, I've got that uh, window of opportunity there. I'll just go ahead and set that to an hour. OK. Scrolling down the page, then, are your main room options. Uh, there are a few different areas here. They're expandable and collapsible menus. Some of these are more useful than others. Uh, session type I just expanded gives me access to either a course session, which typically you will want to use because you're only inviting people within the course unless you specifically enable guests, or a shared one, which allows all registered in all user registered in courses that you teach to be able to access. If you're using uh, master courses here, where all of your enrollments are combined into one Blackboard course, this isn't really any useful for you. But if you are using specifically separate sessions, sections, excuse me, within Blackboard, uh, this would be useful for you if you're trying to meet with each section at the same time. You could enable that. After that are teleconference options. This is being able to allow your students to phone in and hear you lecture. For whatever reason, the default is to not use teleconferencing. I don't know why, because why not give your students that extra option? 
you can use a third party service, but then you have to contract with them and be able to get all the details. And NIU automatically licenses the main Blackboard one. So I recommend that people just click the use built in. It'll set everything up for you. You don't have to specify your service provider. And then once you're in the session, you'll be able to click that little telephone icon to access the number and um, the telephone number and the passcode to give to a student who would want to be able to access that from their phone. Okay, so I just recommend use built-in. You can set this as a default. Again, there's that uh, set defaults option for you. For your sessions, uh, from then on, then you won't have to worry about bothering to re-enable that every time. After that, our room attributes, and this is really uh, the most important options here. A uh, number of things that you'll want to tweak. Recording mode, I always just leave it on manual unless you specifically want it to automatically start recording as soon as anyone enters. But then if you wanted some extra time to set up your slides beforehand, it would be recording all of that too. You can disable that in case you never want to be able to record anything. Maybe you're meeting with a student one-on-one. -on -one. It's very private and you don't want a um, recording of that made. You could completely disable that just in case you're worried about accidentally clicking the record button. Otherwise, leave it to manual. This allows you the flexibility to start and stop it as you please. Afterwards, I had mentioned uh, the number of people that are able to join your session and talk on their microphones or broadcast from the webcams. You can go from just one, you know, maybe you only you only want yourself to be able to talk or broadcast your video or audio all the way up to six. And uh, six gives you a good amount of flexibility if, for instance, you have uh, group work and you want to allow a group of students to be able to talk and present to the class. You can enable up to six at a time. After that, view private messages. This, is, again, is one I always enable myself. Uh, very handy. It'll then show me who's talking to whom in the text chat. It'll look a little bit different from the normal messages in the text chat, so you as a moderator understand, aha, this is a one uh, participant communicating with a different one. So I always enable that. It's another good thing to set as a default. Again, only moderators will be able to see private messages. Other students will not. After that is the All Permissions button. I sometimes enable this. It just helps maybe if you're meeting uh, as an entire class. And it's just kind of a free for all time. It gives all students access to all the different features. Or it may make things a little bit easier if you want to enable, say, the uh, talk and video and text chat automatically at the beginning of the session and then say disable the whiteboard app share and web tour. It's just 50-50, you know, six one, half a dozen of the other. Uh, whether you want to automatically have some things enabled and remember to disable things or automatically have them disabled and remember to enable specific things. I have a question here in the text chat. Can the moderator see what the private chatter is saying or just that they are chatting? They can actually see everything that uh, people have typed to one another, which is useful to make sure that you know that your students aren't harassing each other. Otherwise, you just see uh, their names and you'd see that they're chatting back and forth. This way, it helps you manage your classroom a little bit better. It's kind of like uh, seeing people passing notes back and forth and being able to take them out of their hands and read them, something like that. After that is a raise hand on entry option. This is useful if you're taking attendance. Anytime any person joins for the first time, their hand will be raised. You'll get that audible ding as a moderator. And then you can glance over to your participant window and see who was the person who just joined uh, your session. So useful. Sometimes people find it distracting. So it's not enabled by default, but it might be really useful and handy to you. And it's good that it's there. Allow session invitations is something that I never use myself because the next one, allow guests, is just so handy. Allowing guests creates a link that you can then email the people, as I did today, to invite you into my session. That then gives them access as participants to this session. They don't have to be enrolled in my class. They're there. This allows you to get an outside speaker who you're not adding to Blackboard to allow them to be able to join your session. 
it can be useful for maybe you want to meet with a collaborator on a research project from a different institution. You wanted to talk with them. Blackboard Collaborate is available for you both. You could allow guests here because they're not part of your own class and then send a link to them and then they could join whenever you've scheduled that session. Hiding names and recordings fairly self-explanatory if you're trying to keep everything private later on. Uh, Preloading content unfortunately no longer works. Uh, it used to be that you could add your PowerPoint slides, browse my computer, add those to the session, then when you joined it they would automatically be loaded for you. For whatever reason, uh, this has been broken for the past few patches. Blackboard's been contacted. They said they've been working on it, but currently it's not available. Just know that uh, hopefully one day they'll be able to uh, re-enable that. Question from the audience here, how do you add slides then? That is what I was talking about with that, pre, uh, with that uh, load content button within, um, within uh, Blackboard Collaborate's whiteboard itself. I'll point that out after I've shown uh, the rest of these features here. Good question. Um, Grade Center integration is another option. Unfortunately, this is another thing that hasn't worked for the past few uh, versions of Blackboard Collaborate. It used to add a Grade Center column and automatically take attendance for you. Unfortunately, it's not working. Blackboard knows about it. They'll get to it when they get to it. Um, and then roles and access are the final things. Usually you don't have to worry about this specifically, but if you want to be very uh, particular about how you restrict who is able to join your sessions, this is available to you. If maybe this is a department meeting, you could allow users to join as moderators. But since this is your class, you probably won't allow all students to join as moderators. You'll instead, maybe if you're meeting privately with a different student, restrict access to this session and then specify who's able to join. If another moderator will join, you can add another moderator here. Or if there are specific students you want to be able to join here, you could click the Add Participants button. Uh, I'm not sure if you're able to see this. Hopefully you are this pop-up. And then I'd be able to select different students, click on their names, click a Submit button, and then they would be added in here as participants. I'll do this just so that we at least get a couple other names showing up here if you weren't able to see that. And then you'd be able to create a new session between you and just these other few people. Okay, so let me save this session. Once you're done tweaking everything as you need it, you click the Save button at the bottom, and then you should get a uh, message on the top of your screen letting you know that the session was created successfully. If you had enabled guests, it would also give you the guest link for that up at the top. You could then copy and paste this and then put that in the email for your students. Otherwise, if you've forgotten about that, didn't do that immediately, let me scroll down the page to the scheduled sessions area and you'll see the one we just created here. Now this isn't available yet, so if I click on it, it will take me to a page that says it's not available. But uh, it lets me know that it was created, it's scheduled. I can check to make sure it was scheduled for the correct time. There is this uh, drop down menu link too. If I click that, I can edit the session, delete it. Maybe I may messed something up, made it on the wrong day. I could edit that, just get rid of it all together. There is then a uh, invite guests uh, option to be able to get that guest link again as well. I'll click that so you can see hopefully what that web page looks like. You'll see the URL here. You could then copy and paste it. You could also have the uh, system automatically email those people too. All right. So that is the main session creation features. And I'm sorry for everyone for running over time here, but uh, hopefully that, that was suitable for everyone to be able to get uh, some idea about how Collaborate works, the different features in creating these sessions here. Let me go quickly back to the main whiteboard and go to that uh, moderator interface slide and point out the load content button. So since we had that question, up here at the top, if you were moderators, you would get this load content button. You would click that. You would be asked to find your slides on your computer somewhere. You'd specify those and then it would automatically generate your slides within the whiteboard. It would actually launch PowerPoint. It would take screenshots of your different slides and then add those screenshots to the whiteboard itself. And another question. Do you 
have to actively be an instructor of record to use this program, or is it available to all NIU students and staff? If you have a class, a shell, or you have access to a Blackboard community, you have access to the tool. Otherwise, if you need specific access to it, um, since every department on campus should have their own Blackboard community, uh, you should just be able to uh, request access to the community from whoever is in charge of that. Or if no one actually does have access to it, you could contact DOIT and have them give you access to it yourself. Okay. Again, apologies to everyone for running over. Uh, there's so much information here. It's always hard to fit it into just an hour. I know we started a few minutes late, too. So thank you, everyone, for joining me. Uh, before we break, if there are any other questions, feel free to ask those now. Uh, you can talk. You can text chat. Everyone who's thanked me, uh, thank you so much for joining me today. You are very welcome. Uh, feel free to contact me anytime. Uh, I can help you with any of these other features here. How do we get the slides for these various web sessions? So uh, I can provide you with the slides I had today if you want a few of kind of my overview help slides for the um, actual recordings that I will be making of today's session. Once everyone is out of this room, it then sends all of the data to Blackboard. Blackboard servers do the magic and then add a link to the recording session let me do another app share quickly, point that out. OK, so I should be back in uh, Blackboard Collaborate, uh, the tool within Blackboard. You all hopefully can see that. Down at the bottom, there is the scheduled sessions area. And right next to it is the recordings area. Clicking on that would show me any recordings that would be available later on. And you would have access to a uh, Blackboard archive Blackboard Collaborate Archive, which would basically rerun everything as happened in the class, including all of the text chat, everything that happened to the slides. And as a uh, instructor within a Blackboard course, you could then create a mobile compatible video only version too, if you wanted to enable that for your students. That would then give them the option of joining a, uh, or viewing a recording uh, on their mobile devices, which can be very handy too. OK. Any other last questions from the few people who are able to stick around? Otherwise, we will be making the archive available later on. You can check our uh, programs page. If you go to our uh, faculty development website at niu.edu slash factdev, you can find that under the programs area. You'll notice we've run a number of them so far this year. We have all of them from previous years, too. We have, I believe, a recording on um, the breakout rooms for Blackboard Collaborate if you're interested in those. I go into more depth in a couple of videos on the application sharing as well, including kind of best practices, a few tips and tricks to remember if you're going to do that. Otherwise, a lot of our uh, online teaching, our quality online course series, which uh, Stephanie Richter and Tracy Miller, my uh, colleagues, have done, those have been archived here as well, which are really good. You can then follow us, too, on Facebook and Twitter. Of course, I've got to plug some of those. And you can get in contact with me if you have any questions on Blackboard Collaborate, Blackboard in general, teaching the technology. Always uh, love answering any of those questions for community on campus. Feel free, too, to follow me on Twitter if you're interested. I like following people from campus, like knowing what's going on around campus, too. So that's kind of fun as well. Otherwise, thank you all so much for joining me today. Uh, hope to hear from you in the future. Have a great day.